Okay. <laughs> so what I guess what I um, would like to know too is for you coming in and seeing this whole community start doing urine therapy uh, and then ask you all these questions and kind of put you in a position of leader, how did that change your practice with urine therapy? Uh, it, it changed me on so many levels. It validated for me completely that what I had felt and experienced in my own body was, it had a universality to it. Mm-hmm. That, and yes, there were Facebook groups, but they were people, they were just words on a screen. They weren't people mm-hmm. that I got to listen to and interact with and have them come back and say, I tried the thing and it's working. I did this and this unexpected other thing happened and I'm so excited about it. Or I've been struggling with this for 10 years and after a month, I can see it's better. That that did more to, for me in terms of going, okay, not only am I not alone in this, but people who had never heard of this or maybe had heard of it once, but it always just had never really cared about it, were willing to try it. And that changed me as a leader or my way of understanding it. And the fact that I could actually lead something to do with urine therapy, which had, I knew I'd never stop sharing about it because it was so powerful. But part of what people were saying to me was it was the way I explained it. Mm -hmm. It was the way I presented it. And that was, again, a gift from those people Mm -hmm. that they said that, that they saw that, that it was important how it was phrased. Yeah. Because it, it always feels edgy. It always feels wild to bring Mm -hmm. this up. And so to know that there is a way to bring up urine therapy, to discuss it in a context, in a community with a languaging that it might still feel strange, but people go, no, no, I can do that. There's something Mm -hmm. here that resonates with me. That was explained in a way that makes me want to engage with it. Mm -hmm. That was huge. I always thought it would make me sound like a quack. And I've Mm -hmm. been told multiple different ways. No, it didn't. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So that's important. I think that's important. And, And if you reflect back on why it was unintimidating or inviting what would you why why do you like what what are the particular i mean i know what i heard uh so i can reflect back but if you want to share just your why i was able to open my mouth that first time well no like more of like when people are like the way that you presented it was this like how would you describe the way you presented it that made it more accessible I think, or I guess I feel into the, the, the awareness that I try to bring a physical experience to it and say, I have had a physical experience. I'm basing this on something I experienced. And then I also try to bring in something that is either related to a scientific scientific discovery or an Ayurvedic principle or a yogic principle or something else so that I'm marrying the two together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's really important. It's like the person in front of you, the level of resistance or programming they've had and and what their, what their um, source of, you know, of, of uh, what's the source of their belief. Right. So like, I, I mean, that's kind of references like Dave Gray and liminal thinking, but basically it's like, if your beliefs are based on your experiences, then what are their experiences? If their experiences of medicine are the doctor knows best about their body, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to reference back to science. Like you're going to have to start talking about what's in urine and, and some of the scientific literature about it. Otherwise, you know, if you talk about yoga and they have no experiences based on yoga, then their beliefs about yoga aren't really based on an experience of yoga. So then it's not an access point. But if they are yogis or they're yoga teachers, which a lot of people in our community are yoga teachers, and they have an experience of their body. I mean, the most basic practices in yoga, the the, the yamas and niyamas go back to like 
don't violate yourself, number one. <laughs> like that's rule number one, right? Like no violence towards the self, including at the level of mind. Okay, so then is urine bad? Well, isn't that violent to the body? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. To have, or, you know, in, in a lot of women in empowerment groups that are more on the, whatever, the edgier side, it's like the same thing with menstrual blood. Like you may have been taught that menstrual blood's bad or that menstruation is, a, is dirty or, or stuff like that. Well, that's violence against the body. Yeah. Right. And same thing with poop, right? Whereas if you start to see, it's like, oh, all these things are part of a, they're all part of nature. They're all part of a closed system here. Planet Earth is a closed system, right? So that means it doesn't create waste. It means everything is upcycled. And we see this with any farming culture <laughs> uses manure. Like it's not, yeah. right? It's not so long ago that we used to know these these things. So if that's our experience, and then you have the niyam is niyav svadhyaya or self-study, right? So then you have, again, for the yoga teacher, yoga student, it's like, oh, wait, study the self. Yeah. Don't take other people's wisdom, like study the self and come to your own conclusions, right? Verify first. Uh, so then it's a different, right? Then it's like a different access point than the yeah. person who the doctor knows best. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, you, when you said that about reflecting that back, I, I was interested when I thought back and I haven't, I haven't gone back and watched the video again from, from last year, but I did sort of wonder in the sense of afterwards going, what did I say about urine where it, it clicked for you? Oh, you just asked me, you're like, what do you know about Shivambu? And I was like, what? And you said, urine therapy. And I was like, oh, I read a book on it 20 years ago. What do you know? And I just, cause one of the things that I've learned in being a leader for a long time is like don't pretend you know something you don't so again if someone has a practice it's like the same thing with someone who's done online courses for 10 years versus someone who's been in it for a year mm -hmm. right like if someone has a practice with something that's really different than me reading a book on it and trying it a few times so it was more about the fact that i said i've been doing this for years yeah i right, have a practice right. what do you know what do you know about it because that, yeah. that's not my baseline. And when I was trying to learn about it 20 years ago, I couldn't find people doing it. Yeah. And all the people I knew that were doing it were doing it underground. So they weren't talking about it. Yeah. So I had no way of knowing they were doing it or accessing their wisdom around it. I wasn't initiated into, you know, mm. whatever. Um, so that was surprising too. You know, it's like I read one of my favorite books 20 years ago about the time I was learning about urine therapy and I'm sure this is not a coincidence, was Swami Rama's At the 11th Hour. Hmm. And then since then, I talked to Rosalind Hansen, and she's like, yeah, well, he was like the guru gurus in urine your, your therapy. He didn't put it in his book. Right. Right? And that's tantra for you, is it's like, yeah, we know about this stuff, and you're going to get part of it. Mm -hmm. But you're yeah. not going to get the whole, you're not going to get the taboo. Mm -hmm. So I think what's happened to me over the course of the year is now I'm, I understand that where there's taboo, there's power, which is a basic teaching in Tantra anyway. But mm. now I'm just seeing that more, I would say, on, on so, so many levels. Um, and it is so freeing to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was out at, um, uh, a dinner last week and, and a friend of the family walked by and said, how are you doing? What are you, are you, are you, what are you busy with this week? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm running courses and I'm, and I'm training and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I said, oh, what's the course you're running? And I did a quick thing in my head because I was in a restaurant with lots of people. And I said, it's a six week course on the ancient Ayurvedic practice of Shubambu. And he went, oh, of course it is. And that was enough. And he walked away. <laughs> and that was it was like I was able to say it in a public space completely mm -hmm. truthfully, but yeah. the, and it, 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 it was such a lovely, it was to say that thing that would sound taboo if I used other words, Yeah. but it also, it was exactly what worked for the person asking the question. They were happy. I was happy. It was just this lovely moment. I smiled about it for the night, like, the rest of the evening. <laughs> yeah. Cause you didn't have to hide it. Yeah. You didn't have to cloak it in words that were less true. Yeah. And I, it had never, it was so spontaneous. I'd never thought to say that, but suddenly, yeah. it, you know, there it is. And it, um, 
that's there's another thing from this past year. Although the longer I have done this, the more I have I have been willing to mention to people that I do it. This past year has taken down so many boundaries for me. It's so much easier to just say this is what I do. Yeah. Well, cuz you're less alone cuz you know we'll protect you. You know? <laughs> I mean, even if it's just like energetic, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, yeah, I'll go beat up someone, but yeah. you know, I mean, there's that, yeah, I'm not in this alone. I'm not out there on a limb. I'm not the only witch to be burned at the stake. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's why I've, I mean, I, I was very out about it. I would say anyone who's been paying attention to us at all yes. uh, is clearly aware that that's what's going on. Uh, you know, whether it's on the podcast, whether it's my neighbors, you know, whether it's mm. answering questions with the new yogahealer.com forward slash P dash book, just to get people started, you know, of just like letting people know that there's, I don't know. It's like, I'm much more, I'm much more curious about, again, cancel culture, the edginess of it and the sort of like, what does it matter? Yeah. Like, yeah. what does it matter? If you can't stand for truth, like, what does your life matter anyways? Like, it just, to me, there's just that. Yeah, good. Well, I think the other thing I just want to, you know, with the word Shivambu, uh, that's also been an interesting reflection of the, you know, in, in Sanskrit, words matter, mm. right? So there's, there's no random word. There's nothing random about that language yeah. in general. And it's not like a new word becomes hip because a bunch of teenagers made it up and it became cool later. Like it doesn't work that way. Um, and so when you're dealing with ancient languages that have a lot of intentionality based on vibration and based on, on deep historical meaning, and you take that word Shiva and you take that word Ambu, well, I knew both of those words uh, for a very long time, but not in that context together. So I learned a lot about Shiva and as a as a concept more than as like a god, right? But more of like what is what is the concept of of Shiva? What's the concept of Shivaya? Like what's what's the concept of that which is unnameable? If we look at like mm -hmm. Judaism, right? Like that which is beyond name, but in masculine form that has a feminine counterpart. And then that word Ambu I learned in Ayurveda. Um, particularly with the Ambuvaha Shrotas, the water carrying channels of the body. And so I learned from, you know, Ayurveda, this whole concept of the waters of the body. Yeah. And that's not a concept you find in, uh, you don't find it in like allopathic um, biology, mm. right? Where you have like, well, the body is blood and the body has mucus and the body has tears and the body has menses. And, right, and there's all these what like sweat, like there's all these things that are linked to what in Ayurveda is covered in a word called ambu, which is yeah. this like liquidity. So then you take together this, you know, this word that's divine um, or the masculine principle, and ambu is water, which is the feminine principle, right? And you take that which is at the level of consciousness, and you combine it with that which shows up in form, right, mm. in the in the fluidity. And there you have Shivambu. So yeah. to me, it's like that non-randomness, especially when people are like, how do I, how do I trust this is medicine? And it's mm. like, well, reflect on the word. Yeah. Yeah. And that in Ayurveda, they do not use Shiva for everything. It doesn't get put on everything. It doesn't get put on anything, on anything. It's not so in there. No, they it's do not. A, it's not it an Ayurvedic concept. It's in yoga. It's not an Ayurveda. Yeah. So to that, to that point, exactly. It's like, if you're going to title something with this, if you're going to name it with these concepts, it is elevated. Yeah. So it's fun now, I'd say, as far as like the edge and where I'm going to go next year as we wrap up is like, the, I'm back now. I'm back to the animals, right? The cow mm. urine, the goat yep. urine, the supplement makers mm -hmm. for where science and supplementation is intersecting the marketplace. Uh, because to me, that's it's 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 it, that's even edgier <laughs> for Americans. <laughs> it's like forget like a lot of people be like, I'd rather drink my own urine than cow urine. And then you look at like all these medicines, and you look yeah. at like the cows eating the chlorophyll. 
Yeah. So why, you know, so to yeah. me, it just, it, it just keeps going. It, yeah. it, it keeps getting more interesting. And I love that. I love that the, there's, there's, there's more places to go, whether through the scientific journals, because there's an edge to the microbiome and the virome and all of that, or that there's an edge with the animal urine. Like there's, there, this is an expanding. And the supplement industry, like, cause there is actually, a, I ha, I, we just uh, ordered five bottles of cow urine supplements from India off eBay. Ah. They don't sell them in the U S but interestingly enough, guess who has the patents on cow urine in the United States? The U.S. Patent Office oh. has handed them out. Oh yeah, they're they're purchased. So it's like timing, marketplace, like all these things. I'm sure it's actually already showing up in in drugs. It's just not it's just not labeled as that labeled Americans. Yeah. Whereas in India, they already know they already know cow urine is good for you. It's mm-hmm. part of their culture to know that. But it's more sophisticated to take a pill than to go find your country cow. Yeah. And convenient, right? So. <laughs> Hilarious. Who knew? Well, let me say one more thing about this. It's when, you know, in studying Ayurveda, um, you know, particularly in India, like you read a lot of things on the alchemy and the, and these uses of animals and animal urine and things that make no sense and seem archaic uh, to the point of they didn't know any better. Mm. Right. Our ancient ancestors just used what was around. They didn't know any better. They didn't have all these sophisticated techniques. And then it's right. like, well, if, if we have the science on it, and this is where it's going to get interesting, if we can actually, and we have it with urea on the skin microbiome, um, that ability to, to kill pathogen and nourish human DNA cell. Like we know that at the level of urea right now, Right. Do, yep. But we don't really know that at the level of drinking urine for the digestive tract or shooting urine up the anus for the right. Like there's just all these other microbiomes or snorting it for the sinuses and for the lung microbiomes, et cetera. Right. But what it's all pointing back to is like, wow, actually, the ancients, they, they seem to know. So what did they know about cow urine? Why were they using cow urine in these circumstances and goat urine in these circumstances? And yeah. urine in these circumstances? And the same thing's true with you know, anyone who's studied SIBO and has looked at, you know, fecal implants, mm-hmm. well, that stuff goes back to yellow soup. The Chinese were using it 4,000 years ago. They were using it, the Vedics, you know, they were using it at least a few thousand years ago. So it's like our conception yeah. of ancient medicine traditions really should be evolving. And if we think they were using all these things, and we're talking about the fact that our we feel more intelligent, more internally connected, more feedback loop going on through the whole being, and those were our ancestors, then yes, they came to this medicine. And yes, they made it, they developed it widely, because they had those same feedback loops and intelligence working. Yeah. And that, I suppose, back to that same point about doing more of this, being involved in a community where the community is supporting the discussion, is coming back for more, asking more questions, being inquisitive, being curious, and seeing things change. That also then brings up the ability to talk about it. They just even trusting the words that come out of the mouth and going, what are you asking me about? And then starting to discern and having that discernment about, oh, this question is coming from that place. And you're looking for something because of this aspect of what's happening in your life. And that's an amazing thing that you can't, you have to experience it. You have to be in there with people doing it to have that experience, to answer those questions in a deeper way. Yeah, I agree. agree. That's exciting. It's been an exciting year. Holy cow. Yeah. I kind of, I can't, kind of can't imagine it having gone any other way. Which- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't either now. I can't either. I, I, I remember getting off the first call where I mentioned it and just go, I felt shell shocked. I just felt like what just happened. <laughs> and, and now I understand because it was like the, there was an energy that got released. There was an energy mm. that started. Yeah. yeah. I heard they uh, were talking about drinking urine at the Bitcoin conference in Miami last week. Oh, yeah. well, no. Okay. Yeah. So to me, that means that it's it's already out in the biohacker community where people are, you know, they're yeah. doing the wild habits. So they're doing intermittent fasting. They're doing cryo. They're doing and you know, you they're find doing it. breathing practices. Yeah. And so now that's getting, which is great because that, that'll take the edge off for people who are 
curious and looking to learn and those who might not be at the biohacker level, but really yeah. want to feel good. Yeah. Amazing. Well, wow. well, thanks. Thanks for stepping up and, uh, and taking charge and really helping organize the conversation in the body thrive community. It's been awesome. Yeah. I am. Thank you for letting me speak and listening and encouraging all of this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Good. Where it goes. Good. And where in yoga health coaching you're bringing, it sounds like you're bringing UT in for your coaching group. Yep. I am. Good. And how I'll be doing that. Um, but yeah, people want it. That's the interesting thing, right? I thought, oh no, this will be the secret at the end. And instead it's tell us now. <laughs> That's great. And I, I think we're going to see just more and more of, of that with time as it, as it, you know, it just, it's, it'll get mainstream faster. Like I saw it happen with intermittent fasting where it's like yeah. 2017 was quiet. 2018 was quiet. 2019 was quiet. 2020 it's getting a little louder. Like 2022 it's on the cover of like whatever health yeah. magazine, you know? So yeah, I think it'll happen. <laughs> we'll see. Excellent. All right. Thanks Megan. Thanks Kate. Bye. Bye.